Telecast, the TV industry news review. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to this week's Telecast. On this week's show, John McVeigh, OBE, Chief Executive of PACT, the UK's trade association for film, TV, animation, children's and digital production companies, joins me alongside Claire MacDonald, VP of Brunico Communications and publisher of Real Screen. Peter White from Deadline updates us from LA as the lockdown eases in Hollywood. And K7 Media's Gertz Lesis brings us up to date on AVOD, TVOD, SVOD, everything VOD, as he predicts a bloodbath in the market. It's all coming up on this week's Telecast. So my guests on this week's show are from opposite sides of the pond and are both hugely influential in enabling the production and distribution of TV shows internationally, particularly in the world's biggest TV market, the USA. So welcome to Telecast, Claire McDonald and John McVeigh. How are you doing? Good, thank you, Justin. I'm great, Justin. Thanks for having me on the show. John, we'll start with you, if we may. So you lead PACT, the organisation that represents the interests of UK TV producers, both domestically and internationally. Tell us about the current state of the TV production sector in the UK. Uh, Well, like everywhere else, quiet at the moment. Um, Normally, this would be coming to peak activity, lots of shows starting up. Uh, both domestic and international in the UK, uh, but we're way short of that right now. Uh, obviously, following the um, instructions from our government to uh, socially distance, that impacted on production, which meant that many productions had to stop, be suspended, or indeed some places could close down completely. So um, the first wave of this was dealing with all that. And recently, what we've been working more on is uh, what's called the recovery um, looking at how we get back into production, doing that safely and addressing a lot of the issues that we face uh, in terms of how we do that, uh, how our businesses operate in the new world, but also what that means in terms of additional burdens on production costs, et cetera, et cetera. So for the past 10 weeks, it's not really stopped in terms of our work, but a lot of our members have furloughed staff and are mostly focusing on R&D right now, um, which I think is the right thing to do. Obviously, the UK TV production sector, much like any other production sector around the world, is made up of micro-indies, like small one-man bands or two-man bands, and the industry really relies on freelancers as well, but moving up to these super-indies. Who's been hardest hit, do you think? Well, I think everyone's been hit. I mean, the UK lockdown happened literally before many shows got into production. So um, that was maybe serendipity. But I think everyone's faced, um, you know, loss of revenue, additional costs for locking down productions or suspending productions. Obviously, the emotional cost of furloughing staff, um, all of that, let alone the cost to themselves of having to leave their offices, work remotely. Um, so I think, I think when it comes to costs, it's a range of things. It's not just cash. Um, maybe if there's two, uh, you know, a two-person company uh, who didn't have big premises, were working out of remotely anyway, it might have been a bit easier on them um, uh, compared to somewhere where you've got several hundred people based in your London headquarters and you've got to manage all the processes of who's getting furloughed and who isn't getting furloughed. So, so I think it, it's um, not always about money. It's about a whole range of other burdens, if you want, this is placed on how your business would normally operate. And of course, the UK uh, is one of the most efficient and productive, productive TV markets in the world. Yeah, and we'll come on to talk in a little while, I think, about restarting production and how that's, uh, how that's going forward and what your role has been in, uh, in aiding that. Before we do that, you recently secured a landmark agreement for UK Indies with the BBC. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, this was a very protracted negotiation. Basically, the BBC sought to provide more of the programmes it commissions from independent producers for free for the British licence fee pair. Um, And and rightly, that's the right response when you're facing um, a lot of the international SVODs seeing the UK as the second most important market outside the US. They've got a lot of competition. And of course, us as consumers, we want to watch a box set. 
we don't want to be restricted. So it was quite right in terms of their intention and, and their analysis. The only problem was is they didn't want to pay for any of that. So um, given how we finance in the UK, where we deficit finance, we package up uh, secondary rights, we sell them into different parts of the market, both domestically and internationally, and then we use that to finance the shows we we make for the BBC. So our worry was if we didn't get compensated for that enhanced use, and that enhanced use um, meant that we couldn't raise the same money in the secondary markets, then we wouldn't be able to close the finance or make the shows to the quality we need to make to not just domestically, but clearly internationally. So we were, uh, to say we were at loggerheads on this issue, we'd be putting it mildly. Um, so it's, it's been, it was a very long negotiation. When you think it only covers one clause in the entire commissioning agreement, and normally we can do a whole commissioning agreement in about six months, this took over 18 months to get resolved. And we managed to come up with a new structure where the BBC do pay for that additional use uh, and they compensate for producers both by cash, but also by their license period, reducing the more packages they pick up, the less they get overall. So it's basically about a use package. So if they use it more, the time they have to use it decreases. Um, and we also reset their share of um, our net revenues. So they, they reduce their share, which uh, makes us quite attractive for deficit financing because if I go to a distributor now, there's less payaways to other parties, including the BBC. And we hope the structure we've put in place, of course, with COVID, we've yet to see how the world's going to look. But we hope that the structure will not only compensate producers for more use of the programmes, but also make sure that independent British producers remain attractive for third-party financing as well. Well, the, the UK terms of trade has, has really been a, uh, a model for many other countries around the world, and, and PACT has been a, a key player in securing that. So um, it's great to hear that this new agreement with the BBC has been finalised just actually before COVID hit, or actually, you know, in the in the in the opening weeks of, of the current crisis. So, it's great that that has been agreed. There's so many other things that everybody's got to focus on now in terms of, uh, of getting the business started again. And that brings us to your your first story, which is about production starting back with new pan industry guidance. Yeah, well, this was really led quite rightly by our major broadcasters because they commission producers. Producers are uh, used to complying with very editorial compliance issues or health and safety issues or diversity issues um, for a British commission. Um, so, but the good, th- good thing about this one was the broadcasters involved us in the development of, these, of this guidance. So that gave us an opportunity to involve many of our members for us to get a chance to look at the draft guidance before it got approved by government to feed back on that. And ultimately, it's high-level guidance. It basically says, here are the public health principles, which are effectively health and safety issues. And of course, everyone in production anywhere in the world has to work with health and safety. If we're going to crash a car in the middle of Cardiff High Street, we have to make sure we're working safely. And as an industry, we have very high standards for health and safety. So, But of course, with COVID and the requirements placed on us, for physical distancing. I don't like using the word social distancing. We, we're meant to be physically distant, but it doesn't mean to say we have to be distant from our fellow human beings. Um, and the requirements are, are uh, basically placed by government and the guidance complies with what the government requires. Uh, currently, of course, we hope over the short, medium to longer term that will change. Um, uh, and the guidance is very high level. So as a producer, you will basically look at this guidance and then it's your responsibility to work out how do I create the production protocol for me to make this show underpinned with this guidance. Yeah? So it's not a prescriptive, thou shalt do it this way, you can't do it that way in terms of different genres. Each genre, each production, because each production is unique. You know, if you think about the issues around uh, a drama that's all studio-based versus someone doing a fixed rig shoot in a hospital, um, they're very different different environments, very different challenges. So what we didn't want was 
uh, guidance that was too prescriptive, which prevented us innovating from working out the best editorial way to tell the stories, from working with directors who can come up with a new way to shoot something. Uh, and I think that's that's good, and it gives everyone talent, crew, producers, presenters, it gives everyone hopefully more confidence that as an industry, we take this very, very seriously and we can get everyone back to work as soon as we can and get them back to work in a way where they're safe, healthy, and people can start earning earning again. I want to get as many people off furlough and back to work (laughs) as possible. Uh, All producers want that. For a creative industry, sitting around not being creative is very hard. I mean, maybe if you worked on an assembly line for a car manufacturer, being furloughed for several months might not be too bad. But for creative people, given that it's a vacation as much as a job, it's it's a it's a really difficult thing. So uh, I don't think there's a it's a magic bullet. I don't think it was a big switch where production is rapidly going to ramp up. I think it's going to take a bit of time. Well, it's obviously been a real joint effort from key players in the industry to to get this through in 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 obviously a, a fairly short order i guess the first question i've got is will it mean more cost does it mean a production is more expensive now and are the broadcasters and the commissioners are they prepared to pay that has everybody bought into the fact well, that they're... you know it's going to be more expensive and and the buyers are happy to to pay that well, they're, 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 they're the burning questions. I mean, we've applied um, some analysis to a budget pre-COVID, and then if you had to shoot it now utilising the requirements, you're looking at anywhere between a 10 and 20% uplift. But of course, now we are in a world of COVID, and we have to adapt accordingly. What can we do to mitigate some of those costs? So can we film it a different way? I mean, the idea that you're doing multi-location, foreign locations right now is probably not on. So you may not be able to make it the way you did before. So are you going to use green screen? Are you going to reimagine how to do that? So there will be an increased cost. It's it's not going to be a hard number for everything. um, But clearly where the increased cost of complying to make something um, is be you know would damage a producer's margin or make it untenable, then the financiers, i.e. the British broadcasters, will have to cover that if they want programming. Because one of the other big problems we think we face in the UK is the potential for an asymmetrical recovery, because currently all the big platforms will self-insure, underwrite the costs, uh, and probably underwrite the additional costs of a, of working with guidance which makes them really, really attractive for British, good British producers. I, I really don't want that. I want to see uh, all, our whole audiovisual economy recovering, which includes our domestic PSBs um, uh, and making sure that small factual programs are viable. The, some of the stories that we need to tell about our experience uh, will probably be factual as much as they are scripted. Uh, and I think it's important we get back to our range of programming that we can make safely and at a price which makes it viable. Obviously, uh, we're talking specifically about the UK, the UK industry and UK producers. Have you any insight into what different countries' production communities are doing? Uh, are, they, are they approaching this in a similar way? Or um, uh, have you had any uh, discussions with any of your counterparts in, in other territories? Uh, most of the other territories are also competitors to us. So we're, we're not sharing our thinking and I, they're not really sharing theirs. Clearly, there are territories which have moved quite fast. France, in particular, um, have already introduced um, uh, underwriting for production insurance for their scripted sector. Uh, Australia's are lo- Australia's looking at something. Canada's looking at something. America's looking at a bigger um, insurance underwriting scheme, much like we are in the UK. Um, everyone, no one can get commercial insurance for pandi- pandemic-related. Um, business disruption. So every country is going to have to do something. Um, Those who get out the blocks quicker uh, in terms of offering their domestic sector cover for either enhanced public support or public uh, production insurance clearly are looking to steal a march. And uh, we can't have that. Um, The the UK is a very competitive market. Uh, It's been a hard fought for place to be one of the world's leading audiovisual economies 
Uh, and I'm certainly making a lot of representations to government that one of the consequences of the COVID pandemic shouldn't be to damage one of the most successful parts of our creative economy. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's obviously a, a long and hard fought battle that Pact and, and UK producers have been having so much success over the years. And uh, yeah. um, it's, uh, you know, that's obviously something we want to see to, uh, you know, get back to where it was as soon as possible. I mean, we saw recently Channel 4 has, has announced, you know, huge restrictions on their commissioning budgets. And so we're talking about production budgets naturally going to be higher, commissioning budgets getting lower. At the end of the day, the producer's in the middle and they've got to make it work. They've got to actually solve these problems themselves. How are they going to do it? Well, as I say, there'll be some ways of <clears throat> saving money. Um, but I mean, the important thing is, you know, if Channel 4 doesn't have the same sort of money, ITV doesn't have the same sort of money, they've got to change their editorial specifications then. They can't get the same for less. Um, particularly with if there is a burden from complying with the safe working. So that's going to have to be very careful discussions around what are they getting for their money. Uh, and if they're paying less, somehow there'll be less going on screen one way or another. Um, because what we can't have, this is basically um, producers already thin margins effectively being destroyed. As you mentioned earlier, the terms of trade were significant because they gave producers back end. They gave them a share of revenue from IP. And for many of our companies, that's what's keeping them going. <laughs> you know, production margins in the UK were already wafer thin. Um, it's a very competitive market. People compete on price um, and quality and creativity. Um, but you can't end up with a situation where that competition for ideas is at the price of a business. Uh, that's not a good result for broadcasters. It's not a good for the, for the overall market. Um, we want people to enter this market, to build businesses, to make great programs, both domestically and internationally. That's good for everyone. Um, so, I mean, I think it's a very, very pertinent question. Um, but certainly we've already had conversations with Channel 4 making clear that you will have to adjust your editorial ambitions if you don't have the money. Yeah. Um, because anything other than that will be completely unreasonable. Yeah, yeah. So, Claire, welcome to the show. Um, thanks for joining us. How are things going on over in Toronto? And, and what's the latest goings on at Brunico and, uh, and Real Screen? Well, we... Um have been out of the office. I think March the 16th was the last time I was there. So we've all been working from home uh, during that time. Actually been really remarkable how we have been able to adjust because that's not um, a situation that we've typically uh, worked uh, around, obviously. It's quite incredible, really, what we've managed to, to do um, in the time of, of crisis. Um, we've had to completely rethink our business and uh, come up with virtual events, which we'd never considered until we had to. Yeah, it's been an incredible learning experience, really. Uh, people seem to be in good spirits. We have you know, Zoom meetings and Google Meets and every other platform. Uh, we get to see each other uh, regularly and uh, manage to be as productive as I think you could possibly be in the circumstances. Uh, we are just beginning to see some of the restrictions lifting in Toronto. Uh, so certain uh, businesses are able to return to work. Uh, we're not in a big rush to do that because we are equipped to to work remotely and uh, there's no real rush for us to, to put anybody else in danger. So... Um, we will be in a very phased-in approach. So Real Screen is is obviously a really well-known brand within the uh, factual TV industry for your publications, but also for your events. The summit, obviously, that happens at uh, at the end of January every year, and Real Screen West. Now, Real Screen West isn't happening this year, right? And you've you've launched a new virtual event. That's right. Uh, Real Screen West was scheduled uh, to take place in Dana Point this year, which is in Orange County uh, in California. And that was from June the 2nd to the 4th. And uh, yeah, we had to make a difficult decision. I think it was about six weeks ago, but it just was not going to happen, which in hindsight was the right decision. 
you know, we sort of over the last 11 years, I believe it has been, we've had Real Screen West and it's sort of been a touch point for the industry sort of six months between the summit and the following one. So we didn't want to lose that momentum. So created Real Screen Live, which is a virtual event. And it's going to take place on the same dates as Real Screen West was scheduled for. Okay. All right. Well, we, we look forward to seeing that when that, that comes around. And there's a lot of familiar elements of the usual Real Screen events that you've incorporated into Real Screen Live. Yeah, that's right. Um, we have one keynote, um, which is Jen O'Connell, and she's EVP of Original Nonfiction and Kids Programming at HBO Max. And then we have four panels uh, throughout the course of the three days. Um, then we have our signature 30 Minutes with Sessions, which are broadcaster briefings, essentially. And we have speed pitching, which is what it says, speed pitching, uh, which gives people the opportunity to sign up and uh pitch their ideas to executives. Uh, we, we'll also be um, announcing the finalists of Propel, which is our female accelerator program, which we're doing in partnership with Abby Greensfelder at uh, Every Woman Studios. All right. Fantastic. Well, that sounds great. Well, uh, wishing you all the very best with, with that. Obviously, the the virtual event has become an industry norm now over the, uh, over the, uh, the course of the last two months. So, um, uh, who knows? It may be uh, these virtual events may become part of the new normal of the events, TV events business going forward. You know, we may, may we may see a mix of virtual and and real world events going forward. Yes, we're thinking about that as we plan for next year's Real Screen Summit in New Orleans, which, as you mentioned, was is at the end of January. And at this point. <laughs> We don't really know, do we, what's going to be happening. Uh, so we have to plan for all events, basically. Um, yeah. You know, obviously, we would much rather have the event live in a, in New Orleans. It's our last year there uh, before we move to Austin. And there's just something that's unique to meeting in person that you, you cannot replicate virtually. Um, the chance encounters um, that you have in a in a live setting so we are all you know but the, there is incredible technology around and we will do what we can to unite the community all right okay well we'll let's keep our fingers crossed that uh, as many of our real world events happen as well um so on to your first story of the week. You've uh, highlighted HGTV ordering its first self-shot show as your first story. Tell us a little bit about that. The reason I picked that show was really just to demonstrate how resilient and flexible and resourceful uh, this community is um, across the networks and the uh, production community. Uh, the last couple of months has shown some incredible, you know, ingenuity. Uh, in this particular show, families, uh, including first responders, receive a box of uh, decor items at their doorstep, and then they receive virtual virtual coaching from HGTV design experts, and the, the families record the transformation of their project from start to finish. Um, so they really have adapted to change in circumstance, which is a bit of a luxury in the unscripted genre that we can do that. So, you know, it really does bode well for the genre. A number of uh, very senior executives have commented to me that they've seen massive creativity and they're predicting a, a boom for the genre. So uh, we're hopeful that that indeed happens, of course. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see what kind of ideas and series and stories emerge from the lockdown that but last, what protocols and efficiencies will stick around post-COVID-19? Who knows? We will see, I guess. We will, yeah. And, and actually, on last week's show, we were also talking about the golden age of Unscripted. This could be um, the real opportunity for Unscripted to pick up on the slack that drama production is going to bring about, particularly international drama production, is going to be delayed for however long we don't know how long so production companies and also broadcasters that are uh, agile and uh, and creative can really respond to this and and take advantage yeah it's reminiscent of the writer's strike where you know to the chagrin of the drama community you know the unscripted was able to pick up a lot of slack and gain a lot of momentum that stuck 
So I think that we are uh, well well placed as a community to to move out of us in a good good way. No, absolutely, and let's let's hope we can all come together in uh, New Orleans in January and 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 talk about that, reflect on it, and see what it means for for the next year of uh, of production. So, John, your second story centres on production insurance. We touched on it a little bit earlier. What is the the, the issues around production insurance, and why is it such a uh, a roadblock to productions going forward. Can you just talk us through the current issues and and, uh, and challenges? Sure, yeah. I mean, currently I think there's something like 500 claims going through insurance brokers right now uh, for productions which were suspended or abandoned when the lockdown happened. Um, and there is a long-running narrative in the British press about the failure of some very large insurance commercial insurance companies weaseling out of various clauses where businesses thought they were covered for a pandemic uh, or business interruption clause. And it turns out, oh, read the small print, or we didn't quite mean that. So this is a really risky thing. Um, if you're if you're Warner Brothers, Netflix, you will by and large self-insure your productions because the excesses you have for your global cover are so huge <laughs> that you can go into production. And if there's a subsequent lockdown, it'll probably be painful, but you'll be able to cover that. If you're a small British indie um, and you go into production now, you cannot get cover for any pandemic-related lockdown suspensions or disruption to your production. And of course, that's how we've always insured ourselves. If we have a lead actor who is taken ill and we have to suspend production until they recover so we can then carry on filming, normally that would be covered by insurance. Not now it wouldn't be. So who's going to take on that risk? Well, the broadcasters aren't going to underwrite that. Or if they are going to underwrite that, they will want so much control over the production that why would you be an independent producer? It might as well just be an in-house production. So for independent producers who are small businesses and insure by production, um, it's, we can't see how we can actually step out the door, even with safer working practices, if the government were to call another lockdown, which wouldn't be in our control. We could be doing everything perfectly well. Everyone could be healthy on our production. Everyone could be safe. But the government instructs us to lock down. We would get, no one will offer commercial insurance for that right now. So this is a major problem, not just for our sector, but for the entire UK economy. Um, I mean, governments tend to intervene in areas where you can't get commercial insurance, typically for terrorism, uh, which is called terrorism ray, or you get pool ray, which is for flooding. And what's being talked about now between government and the commercial insurers is something called pan ray, pandemic ray. But that's going to take months to get developed and agreed because the size of the pot the government may underwrite will be astronomical compared to something for localized flooding or or a terrorism attack. Um, so for us as a sector, we're um, working up proposals to government to effectively act as a guarantor for any subsequent suspension costs or abandonment costs. Uh, and I've been working with really smart people across the industry, both in insurance uh, and in production and elsewhere to try and develop a proposal we can take to government. Because if we can get that through, we can start working. We can start taking people off furlough. We can get freelancers back to work so they're not on the taxpayer's uh, payroll. Um, and we can start you know, getting shows for the domestic broadcasters, getting IP back into the pipeline for exports, um, and start rebuilding our e economy. I find it, you know, I mean, some people may find a way to do shared risk um, where they get financiers to share in the risk. But I always worry under those non-legally binding, if you want, uh, ways of working, that the producer is always going to take the hit. Yeah. Uh, and that could mean you losing your business. If there was a lockdown and you're suddenly liable for several hundred thousand pounds of costs, you're going to pay for that. that that's, that's quite a... Um, um, sobering thought when you're thinking about starting production that if something were to go wrong not because you've done anything wrong that you would be liable for that and that, that's, that's going to be a big drag on the UK recovery if we don't get it right 
because all the inward investment, the, all the US platforms will move quicker because they'll be able to not only cover the cost of the COVID costs, but they'll also be able to cover the cost of the insurance issues. So they'll move quicker and get back into production quicker, which is fine. That you know, I'm not complaining about that. But we can't see an asymmetrical recovery in the UK. The domestic sector has got to be able to compete and recover as quickly as inward investment. Yeah. You mentioned uh, France being one of the uh, first countries to start to resume production. How have they dealt with in the insurance uh, issue over there? Uh, they're basically getting a government guarantee for suspension and abandonment. Right. Okay, so it's it's a, it's a similar approach. The principles of insurance are pretty much. I mean, I wasn't an expert on this until recently, and I'm, <laughs> I'm still not. Um, but the, the principles are the same, really. We've developed a different proposal to what they're doing in France, um, but the principles are the same. In order to have business confidence, you need to be insured or have some underwriting or guarantee. Right. Okay. Well. Um, this is, a, a, again, a, a huge issue. And, and presumably, until this is fixed in the UK, as you said, nobody can really step out the door and make a TV program. Well, I mean, some will because they're desperate and they need to, or they've managed to find some way to, to cover the potential risk. And, and good luck, hats off. But there's a big risk. Uh, we don't know what's happening with the pandemic. What I fear is where shows maybe could get back into production because of the COVID-related costs or because of the risks around not being insured, people will hold back going back into production. They'll, the suspension will be longer. And that, that's not good for us overall. It's not good for our schedules. It's not good for our creativity. It's not good for our exports. Uh, and clearly, this is the summer. This is normally when we're, we're filming. This is normally principal photography. There's very little principal photography going on right now. Yeah, well, I, so it's all, it's really all about building that business confidence and removing the roadblocks to to that recovery. So, well, uh, well, good luck with all of that, John. That's that's obviously fantastic uh, work that you guys are doing I, there. I, and I'll come back on and let you know if we if we're successful. Absolutely, I'll be uh, I'll be on I'll be on the phone or another Zoom. I won't let you forget that promise. Um, okay. So, Clay, your second story is uh, around Leonardo DiCaprio producing a feature doc. Um, tell us about that. Yeah, um, the story ran just yesterday in a real screen, and it was an announcement that Hulu, Hulu is at premiering uh, the film And We Go Green, which actually launched last year at TIFF. But it just reminded me of how many celebrities are attaching themselves to documentaries. Uh, it's you know not new this week. It's been over the last couple of years. There's just been this huge proliferation of productions that have celebrity names attached to them. Uh, A&E Networks just announced Lincoln and Theodore Roosevelt and another three-parter, The Man Who Built America. And they're all produced in part by Leo DiCaprio. He's a pretty busy guy. And then there is a, a new series in the works at A&E with Bill Clinton. Uh, then, of course, there's Trial by Media, which is on Netflix right now, which is exec produced by George Clooney. And then, of course, there's everything that's coming out of uh, the Obama's higher ground uh, productions. So it's not necessarily a new trend, but I feel like there are more and more stories happening with those celebrity names attached to them. And I think it speaks to the, the golden age of non nonfiction because people are watching it and uh, there's an opportunity there. And there's just been this incredible resurgence of a fantastic documentaries and these people want to have their names attached to them. So it's more of an observation than a hot, hot news story. No, absolutely. I, I think that, obviously, again, the scripted industry is going to be on hold for a little bit longer than unscripted. Then perhaps we might see more and more of these passion projects that come through from some of these really well-known Hollywood actors that um, that want to tell the stories, to tell the unscripted stories. So, um, so that's really interesting. Well, we'll uh, keep our eyes out for more of those. So now it's time for Hero of the Week. This week, John, you're going to go first. Who's the person that has inspired oh. you, delighted you, um, or a person or thing, uh, indeed, that, uh, that, that gets your uh, accolade of Hero of the Week? Hero of the Week, uh, good weather. Ah, excellent. Sun, sunshine in lockdown is way better than rain in lockdown. Yeah. Um, we, we, uh, during this past 10 weeks, we've had 
maybe one week where it rained the whole week. And that was way more stressful for everyone than, you know, a little bit of sunshine, a little bit of hope, a little bit of there is an outdoors. Um, so I, I would say, you know, good weather is a big hero during lockdown. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I've said that myself, I think, to, to many people that uh, that if it was the normal London springtime weather, early summer, late spring weather that yep. we, uh, we usually have, it would be a much more miserable place. But uh, we've been blessed by, uh, by, by the weather gods, at least. Claire, who's your hero of the week? My hero of the week is a gentleman by the name of Chris Sloan. And... I have not had the pleasure of meeting him, although he has been to a couple of our events over the years. And I read about him in a regular column in Real Screen by Joe Levesque, who tells unique personal stories of members of the global community. Chris is a former unscripted exec, uh, network exec, and he now runs a production company in Miami. Six years ago, he lost his young son, Calder, in a horrible accident. Um, He said that his son has incredible empathy and compassion and the word that best described him was awesome. And that's what he and his wife used to call Calder, Mr. Awesome. Three days after they buried him, a friend of Chris has put a self portrait of Calder on the web with a Mr. Awesome across the top. It went viral and many, many celebrities held up the picture and Ellen did a segment uh, to Calder. The Sloan then started the Caleb and Calder Sloan Foundation, which services missions around the world. And so far, they've sent half a million dollars of aid. When COVID hit, they created a campaign to match donations for people giving to charity that helps first responders and people fighting the virus. And so far, they've raised $120,000, benefiting 100 different charities. So Chris Sloan is my hero this week. Well, absolutely. I mean, I think we, we can all uh, we can all support that very much so. And and actually, for those who want to know more about the foundation, uh, there's a link in the podcast description to the foundation website. So please go and check it out. And now it's time in the show, Claire, to find out who or what you're going to be telling to get in the bin. Well, Justin, I am going to throw working from home permanently in the bin. There's many ups to the situation. I don't have the commute that I generally have. I don't spend a whole ton of money on gas. I don't have to pay for parking. But I really, really miss the camaraderie of being in an office with my colleagues. And it's one of those situations where the grass is always greener, or is it? Yeah, absolutely. I I think, you know, and that's something we're, we're very much getting from a lot of people that we're having on the show is that um, you take it for granted. I think you know the the amazing people that you work with in a uh, in a personal capacity in an office. You know, even the guy that you pass in the in in the store every day, or you go for your morning coffee, or all of these regular things that you don't think twice about. You know, it, you you realize how actually important that human connection is, and uh, when we're all forced into this lockdown. Then it, it really brings that uh, you know it brings that home. So uh, I think I, I'm I'm certainly with you on that one. It can it can get in my bin as well. I think. Perfect. <laughs> All right, Claire. Um, fantastic. Thank you so much for being on the show this week. Really appreciate your time. Uh, I'm sure you're incredibly busy at the moment. So um, thanks again for coming on the show, and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks again for having me, Justin. So John, coming back to you. Who or what are you throwing in the bin this week? I think the Home Office migration consultation, I think it's badly timed. Um, I, I think it's not consistent with public sentiment right now. Um, I mean, we will end up with something that will control the British borders better. That is a manifesto undertaken, and I, I respect um, the government's commitment to do that. That's what they were elected to do, and I'm a Democrat. However, I think in terms of timing, um, uh, and particularly the impact on carers or health workers going forward, I think that it's a crass moment to open up that consultation uh, and look to do anything which wouldn't be chiming with the sentiment of br- the British population, which is by and large, these people are heroes. Um, they're not migrants, they're heroes. <laughs> um, so I, I despair at that. I, I'd hoped that this 
brutal experience for everyone um, may have brought a bit more of political wisdom and insight. So, Yeah, well, I, we were also talking, it's, it's almost a weekly thing when we start to talk about how governments are, are handling uh, communication issues mainly uh, yeah. around uh, uh, around these these various issues. And you're right, I think that the timing of that oh, doesn't seem... I've familiar. got another, I've got another bin it. Okay, this is the first ever double bin. So I've got John, a double bin. The yeah. double bin is right. The double bin is stay alert. Ah, yes. What does that mean? That 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 that's a that's a ideology. It's not a practical instruction. <laughs> no, no, exactly. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, John. Thanks so much for your time. In, in, in pleasure. What- which is obviously a you know incredibly busy time for you at the moment, and uh, in the middle of your negotiations to get the wheels of the UK production industry going again. So um, thanks again for uh, for taking the time on the show, and uh, we'll uh, we'll no doubt see you in person hopefully soon. And you take care, uh, uh, and uh, thanks a lot. Best wishes. So it's that time in the show where we head over to Hollywood and chat with Deadline's Peter White. Hi, Peter. How are you? Hi, Justin. I'm good. I'm good. Are you? Yeah, very good. The lockdown's easing, I hear, in uh, in LA. Uh, yeah, we're all uh, we're all heading to the beach, uh, or that's certainly the plan, at least. And it's still the upfronts, or the upfronts that aren't upfronts, I suppose. But um, but uh, I hear there's uh, there's been some news from CBS. Yeah, I guess you're right. Quote unquote upfronts. So uh, we would have been in New York at some point uh, in May to to talk about all of this, but now they're stretching them out for uh, a couple of weeks. Yeah, CBS was this week. That was uh, a, a big a big sort of statement in terms of what their full schedule looks like, or as uh, Kelly called their their chief programming guy, uh, quote unquote full, um, depending on when. Uh, when they can launch a number of new shows, so yeah, they uh, they announced a, 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 a few a few new things that they're going to try and try and fit in uh, this year, which includes uh, the Equalizer, Queen Latifah, uh, a new Chuck Lorre comedy called Be Positive, and then something for mid season, a Silence of the Lambs sequel, Clarice. Uh, but what's interesting, obviously, there's no no set return for for production yet. They're they're sticking these shows into into the full schedule. So whether that means that there'll be shorter runs, whether that means uh, things will be produced a little bit closer to TX that seems to be the the idea but they're trying to to plow ahead with some new shows at least which uh, I guess in any other year this schedule would have been would have been considered quite conservative but this year it feels uh, feels a, a little bit uh, different it feels a little bit uh, taking risks because uh, there's no no real sight uh, as to when these shows will will go up and running yeah, so it's a bit of a gamble, really. You know, they could uh, we could find out something completely different from uh, from what they're published right now, right? In terms of what comes on air. Yeah, they've got a few options. Uh, Kelly Cole was was keen to stress that they have stuff in the pipeline. Obviously, they're they're owned now by Viacom CBS. So whether that's taking some stuff from from its other cable channels to to fill some holes, there's a couple of shows still on the bench. Uh, there's a second season of a show called Blood and Treasure. Which could slot in, but but they're they're banking on these these being ready. But they, I guess, they are working out. They've got a few months now to to figure out if that will be the case. But uh, interesting nonetheless. So, what else did we learn from the uh, CBS upfronts? So there was a lot of talk about whether whether it's reality shows, Love Island and Big Brother can air this summer. They're they're still optimistic that those shows can. Obviously, they can uh, they can turn around quite quickly. Uh, you've got Survivor and The Amazing Race, which are, are slightly different cases, given that that they show it internationally. But it also raises a question about uh, what CBS is going to do with reality. They've got a, a filler filler gap. Sharon Vong uh, left for, for NBC earlier um, earlier this month. So they uh, we spoke to Kelly, and he said that they're reevaluating. That role, um, whether that means bringing in a, a new external third-party candidate or, or changing the function completely, CBS does a, a slightly less reality than than some of the other networks. But it is interesting because that's obviously one area that international producers do good business with uh, with the American networks on the reality side. Whether that's things like Undercover Boss from from Studio Lambert, but that seems to be an area that, that, that they're having a think about, which I guess will have some ramifications uh, internationally. Yeah, and I'm sure in the short term that uh, the, the, there's going to be a bit of a rush on unscripted whilst 
scripted production slows down for a little while. So it looks like uh, Apple are starting to make some big content plays. It feels like that. Yeah, I guess Apple Apple launched a, a few months ago, and, and and we haven't really heard too much too much since since everyone was talking about the morning show. But uh, this week felt really interesting because uh, they did one massive movie deal. They they bought the rights to a, a big Tom Hanks film uh, called Greyhound, which is uh, around seventy million dollars, a, a battleship drama, World War Two. Uh, it was going to be released theatrically, and now will go straight to Apple TV Plus. That felt interesting. They also bought a, a blue chip doc series from the guys behind Millions. This one's a, a, about a government a government scam. Uh, they've got Sophia Coppola making Edith Wharton's The Custom of the Country. Uh, they did a first look deal with Ridley Scott, Scott Free Productions. So all of those things in in the last uh, last week or two feel like they're they're moving into into stage two, I guess. And uh, I mean that that'll be interesting to see whether whether they can keep up momentum. Um, they they sort of put out a tiny sense of of data. I guess I'm not sure you would call it data, but information that Defending Jacob, which was their their crime drama starring Chris Evans, looks like it was the the second biggest show after the morning show. Um, uh, similarly to, to the likes of Netflix and, and Amazon, Apple doesn't send out ratings data or, or give you any real indication about how these shows are doing. But but I guess we'll take what we can get. And, and the fact that that's number two is is interesting in some sense. Uh, the Beastie Boys doc was more uh, more number number one in my house, but uh, it does feel like Apple is uh, is gearing up a little bit over the last week or two. Well, a business like Apple in these times that's cash rich, then presumably there'll be some uh, opportunities coming their way, both in terms of content, but also companies maybe in the uh, in the next uh, next few months. Um, I see Steve Coogan's got a classic reboot in development. <laughs> yeah, I love this story. I was doing uh, an interview with the the guys behind Snowpiercer, the the TV remake of that a company called Tomorrow Studios, um, and, and they mentioned that they've got Steve Coogan and Hart Hansen, who's the creator of Bones, the, the long running Fox drama, that are going to uh, going to write a new adaptation of uh, <laughs> of the Persuaders, which uh, I guess Coogan is is admired for a while he, there was talk a, a few years ago that he was going to star in it with ben ben stiller but it now looks like he's going to write a write an american tv version of it uh, that that'll be fascinating you know the uh, the original uh, with roger moore and tony curtis um you know you, you that would be perfect for a co-production i guess with a, a britain and american uh, working for a, a shady billionaire but uh, I, I thought that was really interesting steve coogan obviously coming off the back of the trip and um, and Hart Hansen hasn't really done anything since Bones, so uh, we'll we'll watch that one. That could be uh, could be fascinating. Oh, definitely. Any uh, any opportunity to hear uh, Steve Coogan's Roger Moore impersonation again? Then uh, <laughs> you know I'm a big fan of his. Exactly. Peter, thanks as ever uh, for uh, your time this week. Um, stay safe in LA. Enjoy this slight loosening of lockdown, and uh, and we look forward to catching up with you next week. Thanks, Justin. See you then. So it's that time in the show when we get to join K7 Media's Gertz Lesis. And this week we're discussing SVOD, AVOD, TVOD, everything VOD. Gertz, obviously a time of huge disruption within broadcasting and in particular digital. We had Olivier Jolet from Pluto TV on uh, on last week's show. It was really interesting to hear from him about the AVOD model that Pluto is, uh, is, is having some real success with. Which models are going to work? SVOD, AVOD, TVOD? That's a great question, Justin. I mean, it's such a paradox with all the doom and gloom many businesses are currently experiencing that we continue to witness a new streamer with major ambitions launching literally every month. And with HBO Max next week and Peacock in mid-July, the overall feeling is almost like if they are panicking to miss out on what they all apparently believe is this super attractive streaming space, which is so far lacking what each of these contenders believe, just their unique offering. Well, bless them. But when it comes to different business models, subscription-based streamers currently may sound like totally bulletproof frontrunners, at least from what we hear publicly. From some pretty impressive stats all throughout this pandemic period in terms of the growing number of subscribers as well as uh, streaming hours to very encouraging forecasts of SVOD uh, revenue growth globally, by more than 80% within the next five years, with some major markets like UK projected even to double the revenues. We also hear about 
TVODs or transactional services, particularly as a possible threat to movie theaters, as they have gained attraction during the current lockdown as a preferred choice for film lovers. But then, and what honestly perhaps surprises me the most, uh, that no one is really talking anymore about ad-supported VOD services, which still at the beginning of this year sounded almost like everyone's favorite in terms of their growth potential. I get that it's kind of unpopular to back them at this moment when the advertising is suddenly so down, but I think it's a bit unfair. Now, with all this hype, particularly around SVODs, at times it seems like we are choosing to ignore that there will come a moment when we'll feel the consequences of halting productions for several months, that people will gradually uh, return to their normal life routines with their priorities shifting away from the screens and streaming hours per subscriber likely decreasing. But most importantly, I think it will take still quite some time, unfortunately, for the households to hit the bottom caused by this crisis economically. And that's when they will really start to rethink whether they need those three, four or five subscriptions or they can cut a few of them to pay other bills. And that's when people are going to make some pretty simple choices. Basically, any service can be labeled either must-have or nice-to-have. And many of the nice-to-have ones are going to suffer. So which are the must-have ones? To put it simply, must-have is something that's reached the utility status. Something as essential as water, gas or electricity. At the moment, globally, there is just one, and that's Netflix. Have a look at social networks or dating sites or whatever where people are talking about their hobbies or plans, and you will see that when asked what they are going to do this weekend, most will say something like, oh, I'm probably going to stay at home, have some nice wine and watch Netflix. In the same manner, people 20 years ago would talk about going to movies or watching a DVD. That plain and simple, and as straightforward as Netflix's uh, business model. People are not talking about any other specific service in that same manner. I think Disney is possibly the only other realistic contender for a similar status in the near future. Just because the brand itself is so immensely strong, we have all grown up with it, and the positioning is also super clear and simple. I must say, unlike Amazon, for instance, a brand which basically is the world's biggest supermarket, but when it comes to video offering, for some reason they try to play a high street Louis Vuitton or Ferrari, and that can be quite confusing for consumers. Now, when it comes to the rest, of course, every single one of them is going to have their own loyal fan base. But in general terms, people won't care too much if one of those services has 10,000 more hours of programming than the other or 100 more movies than the other. So yes, there will be a bloodbath sooner or later. And I guess that's the price one has to pay for whatever was taking them so long to adapt to the new digital reality. However, when it comes to households' budget cuts and ad-supported VODs, the nice-to-have ones, not only generalist services, but also more niche, genre-specific ones, are much more likely to stay untouched. So answering your first question about the safest VOD business model, in short to medium term, a mixed tier service with a basic free ad-supported offering and a premium subscription or pay-per-view on top of it, I think is definitely the safest bet. So it sounds like you're slightly advocating AVODs over the other services. That's true. I really see the mid to long term future of um, AVOD is very bright. And there are a few reasons for that. First of all, we are used to look at streaming business very much from the Western point of view. Rightly so, as that's uh, where it originated. However, we don't have to look too far to find markets and cultures which just don't have the tradition of paying additionally for what they are watching. Say Central Europe or Russia, for instance. Most people have grown up watching everything for free and many still don't get it why now they are required to pay for something. That's one of the reasons why the piracy levels are so high there. It's not like people are born there to break laws. I think it's way they show their protest about something that feels strange to them. It's similar in many Asian markets where, in addition, the purchasing power is extremely low compared to Western standards. The subscription services see the business opportunity there as this region is so populated that it makes for a scale economy. 
but average revenue per user is very, very low. And in many Asian territories, consumers would also naturally go for free services. The Southeastern Asian streamer Eflix, for example, reported that consumption of its programming doubled within five months of adding its AVOD tier. But also in the West, different research increasingly show that the tolerance towards advertising is returning, particularly among younger people who are often on tighter budgets, but also because they have grown up watching the ad-supported YouTube, which is the new normality for them. But of course, we're talking a very different, individualized, focused, smart advertising, not the long impersonal commercial breaks as we know them from linear television. And then there is another factor. As previous crises are suggesting, advertising is usually bouncing back considerably faster than purchasing power of individuals, while the households will still have to make very tough cost-cutting decisions, brands will have to start spending again. As ever, a crisis is also an opportunity. Many businesses will try to use it to increase their market share, and for that reason, they will need to be seen and heard. And even the brands that will still be leading eventually will have to make a decision to invest in their brand marketing as a priority, since otherwise they would just risk to lose out in this market race. And at that point, AVOD might appear to be in a stronger position than traditional television when reaching for these post-crisis ad dollars, as they are able to more accurately quantify its audiences through data, creating way better returns on investment and far greater accountability for their advertising partners. So AVOD looking at the, the future is looking bright for AVOD, you think. Um, do you see any other VOD strategies emerging or where there are additional opportunities? I think one interesting trend we are seeing is growing of clusters, not so much around a specific region, but around a specific language. For example, Shahid, a Middle Eastern streamer with great ambitions to become a leading service of Arabic content, or a Chinese language short form original programming streamer Mplay Asia, which just launched, targeting young urban professionals in Singapore, Malaysia, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Or Discovery in its turn, working together with a Polish partner to launch a service that will offer Polish programming, including originals, and not only in Poland, but also internationally. I think there is another aspect of uh, video consumption which this lockdown period has highlighted as underserved by the streamers in particular. And that's uh, the revelation that there's value in being able to provide human connection. Viewers expect a sense of community with added social features, not only helping to keep users interested, but also encouraging more in-app spending. So that's really interesting, Gert. I mean, what sort of timeline? You talked about a bloodbath within these VOD services. When do you see that really starting to, to kick in? Well, a lot of depends, obviously, how long will be this period we are going out of the current uh, situation. But um, I would give like two, three, four year lifespan for some of the streamers. Okay. Well, it's it's going to be really interesting to watch. And obviously, there's going to be many changes in the uh, traditional linear broadcasting landscape as well over the next next few years. So uh, fascinating to watch. Let's keep our eye on AVOD. And TVOD as well. And TVOD. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Gertz, as ever. Thanks so much for joining us. And uh, we look forward to catching up with you next week. Absolutely. Take care. So that brings us to the end of another episode of Telecast. Thanks as ever for listening. Don't forget to share the show on social media and tell your friends and colleagues about it. And give us a quick review on Apple Podcasts. It only takes a minute. So thanks again. We'll see you again next week and stay safe. <laughs>